Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. We would also appreciate it if you would make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education resources. You can find a donation button located at the top of our channel page and at the top of the Your Dog's Friend webpage. A link to our webpage along with the speaker's contact info are listed in the description for this video. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to your Dog's Friend webinar series. And I hope you're as excited to watch this webinar as I am. First though, let me tell you something about the speaker. Uh, Dr. Megan Conley is a veterinary behavior resident who runs Atlantic Veterinary Behavior in Montgomery County, Maryland. She does in-home consultations in and around Montgomery County and the surrounding areas, as well as phone conversations. Okay, I know that you'll learn a lot from what Dr. Conley has to say. Dr. Conley, it's all you now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this somewhat muggy and cicada filled afternoon here um, in Montgomery County, Maryland, but I know there are many of you from joining from afar as well, so welcome. Um, that's one of the bonuses of being able to do this as a virtual presentation. So I am presenting from hyper hound to happy hound. A little bit about myself. I am a veterinary behavior resident. I am in my second year. My mentor is boarded behaviorist, Dr. Leslie Sin of Behavior Solutions for Pets. She is based in Leesburg, Virginia. And I do see on occasion um, appointments with her as well at that location um, to my Gaithersburg clinic. So AtlanticVeterinaryBehavior.com. Uh, just a little bit about how I delved into behavior. This is Lily Bean. She is a hound rescue that I was fostering. And as you can see in this, these two photos, she was quite scared and timid, um, but was also a very active, athletic young dog. So she was in need of some extra special care and Dr. Sin helped me work through a treatment regimen for her that included both medications as well as a training plan. Um, and that's the case for most of the patients that we see. As you can see now, once we found the treatment plan that worked well for her, she is much more relaxed and happy and enjoying the life around her. All right, so let's get started. What does hyper mean? A lot of folks use the term hyper to describe their dog. Um, the dictionary lists it as hyperactive or unusually energetic. Now with dogs, what does this look like? This can look like jumping, pawing, pacing around, walking back and forth, barking, getting into absolutely everything and anything and not listening to their owners. Also dogs under this category can also be described as unruly. Um, most of the dogs that are described as hy hyper also fall under this category. And in most cases, the dogs are understimulated um, and they may also be genetically wired to have these incredibly high levels of energy and activity. Things, breeds such as working dogs, German shepherds, um, Australian cattle dogs, um, but also in some cases, the unruly behavior can get worse or continues because it is being inadvertently rewarded by the people in the dog's life. So diagnosing hyper dogs. So there are several different diagnoses that include hyper, um, overactivity, generalized anxiety disorder, hyperreactivity, hyperactivity or hyperkinesis, and attention-seeking behavior. 
these are the most common. There is an excellent paper um, by Karen Overall, and I put the link in my handout on the categorization of different dogs with these different hyper diagnoses. Um, and it can be quite helpful for any veterinarians or trainers in the audience. So the overactive canine. So I do work with some working dogs, some police dogs for the government, and a lot of them are Belgian Malinois or shepherd breeds. Um, they can have excessive motor activity. They're always ready to go. They want a job, they want to do it, and they want to do it well. Um, but these dogs are able to actually settle and calm down when they have that physical activity and interaction. Um, so again, you want to look at usually it's type a young dog type of working breed um, in an engaging environment and you want to look at their physical environment as well. Generalized anxiety disorder uh, is very more commonly seen I think now. Um, unfortunately, it may be a side effect of the pandemic. <laughs> so constant monitoring and hypervigilance. So these dogs are constantly scanning their environment, looking out the windows of their home, watching the street. Um, they may have uninterrupted, um, sorry, interrupted sleep, um, increased activity where they're pacing around the house, uh, also panting, open mouth panting, and they may have an elevated heart rate and their pupils are generally dilated. They can be easily distracted by passerbys, whether it be other animals or humans or vehicles. Um, and it's very, very difficult for these dogs with general anxiety disorder to really concentrate and learn and pay attention. So a lot of folks with dogs that fall into this category are having trouble with training, um, especially training in any area other than you, their main living space. A lot of the, do the dogs in this category also have diarrhea or other GI symptoms. Um, new environments are a huge trigger and really increase the dog's anxiety. And with these dogs, we have owners saying, you know, I take them on several hour long walks every day, or I run so many miles, we do agility, all these things, but these dogs still are not able to settle despite all this physical exercise where they should be physically exhausted. Nighttime hyperactivity. So nighttime hyperactivity is a dysfunction of the sleep wake cycle. This can be caused by either fear or anxiety. There could be a change in the dog's normal schedule. Um, they usually are provoked by any outdoor stimuli, whether that be car door shutting, alarms going off, fox noises outside. Um, and in older pets, it could be a symptom of cog canine cognitive dysfunction. So the first step is to rule out any underlying medical conditions because increased activity can sometimes also mean pain where an animal just can't get comfortable or sleep through the night. So we just want to rule out that there's no underlying disease causing these symptoms. A change in schedule. Um, so if you're looking at your schedule and your dog has started waking up, if you look to see, well, geez, you know, you either took on a new job and have a different shift or now you're also playing, um, you know, going to play baseball after work instead of coming home and taking your dog for a nice long walk, um, things like that. So trying to get back to that normal routine or help establish a more stable schedule. You want to make sure that they have a nice, comfortable rest area, especially with the older dogs that may be arthritic or those without a lot of padding or fur like greyhounds. They need nice, comfortable soft beds to lie down. And again, you want to make sure that you're providing proper physical and mental stimulation for your pup. There are some medications that can be used. Um, melatonin is usually the first step, and this is just an over-the-counter supplement that you can get. I do recommend that you do not use the gummy version as this can sometimes cause sweeteners that are toxic to dogs. So the normal tablet form is fine. And then there are other medications that your veterinarian or veterinary behaviorist may prescribe. And this includes gabapentin, alprazolam, lorazepam, or clonazepam. Again, these are, there's many different medications out there and these would be up to the discretion of your veterinarian, depending on what's going on with your pet. Attention seeking behavior. This is also a very common complaint that we have with some of our patients. Um, 
the dogs become very easily distressed. They be can become incredibly vocal, whether they're howling or crying, whining and barking at the owners while the owners are not paying 100% attention to them. Um, in order to also try to get the owner's attention, uh, the dog may paw, grab, jump, mouth, um, family member's hands, trying to get their attention. Um, and usually they do get more stressed out even if you are giving them some attention. And all of this is usually directed towards a human, although sometimes it can also be directed towards another, like another dog in the household. ADHD, so I get a lot of clients who come in who have dogs that are very hyperactive and energetic, and they tell me that they think the dog has ADHD. The research in canine medicine has shown that this is in fact a very rare disease found in dogs. Um, it is overactivity is part of it. They do have a very poor attention span, like some of the other diagnoses that we previously discussed and unable to train and learn new behaviors. These dogs can also sometimes become very aggressive because their overactivity just escalates and amps them up to such a high degree. Um, and these dogs are just unable to settle even in their calm and neutral environments, such as the living room of your home. So in normal humans and in animals, amphetamines will make individuals more hyper through CNS stimulation. However, in dogs with ADHD and in humans, when they're given amphetamines and methylphenidate, it actually makes these animals calmer. And this is how we diagnose and confirm that a dog does actually have ADHD. And this is usually something done in clinic where we can see the response within several hours. So why is having a hyper dog an issue? Most of you who do have hyper dogs probably know why. Um, this is placing a huge strain on the bond with you and your pup. The quality of life of both your pup and you are affected. And a lot of these behaviors that are exhibited are self-reinforcing. So they tend to even get worse and escalate if they're not appropriately managed. So the first thing is to really take a good look around. Look at the entire picture. Look at the context. You want to take a thorough history, look at all what all of your family members are expecting from their dog. Each person may have different expectations. Um, look at the physical and time constraints of humans within the household as well as the canine. So you need to consider their life stage, their breed, background of the dog, whether they were from a very rural environment and not used to living in downtown um, versus an older dog who may not want to go for a three hour long hike down Sugarloaf Mountain. Um, you want to really be able to get a look at your dog and capture that if possible on video to present to your trainer or behavior veterinarian in your home environment. It can be incredibly helpful for us to see the different situations. And most folks have smartphone capabilities with them now, so it does make it a bit easier. So we really need to manage our expectations. When you get a puppy or adopt an older dog, um, you wanna make sure that you're familiar with the breed, whether they're a working hunting dog or a racing dog like a greyhound. Um, consider their age. Puppies tend to be a lot mouthier and they have a lower bite inhibition than adult dogs. So they go through different phases. They also have a tendency to have a very frequent awake sleep cycle. So with activity levels in between. Um, so you need to make sure that you can provide some sort of help for them during throughout the day, as opposed to an older dog who may just need a couple walks a day. Um, you also want to consider dogs' brains develop over the period of several years. So social maturity starts at about 10 months of age in most breeds and continues on until they're almost 24 or two years old up to three years old. Um, different parts of the brain model at different times. And so it's not uncommon for a lot of us veterinary behaviorists to see dogs around the two to three year old mark where folks are telling us that their dog, you know, their pup as a puppy was very social and engaging and listened, but now they've become this really hyper monster. Understanding a little bit of canine social dynamics and how canines brains work is important. Um, canines 
live in extended family groups. They have a lot of parental care involved. They work together as a family to help provide for the young in the group. Play is used to develop social skills and you probably see that if you have any young dogs um, and older dogs helping teach them what is okay and when enough is enough. Um, they communicate both through vocalization as well as through physical communication and body language. So body language and posture is very key. Um, their social system is based on deference to others. So they'll wait for someone else to give them input on the ongoing situation. Uh, so you may see in this photo here, the hound dog is looking off to the left and then she quickly looked to the other two dogs who are sitting there calmly and said, oh, okay, we're not gonna freak out about that person walking, walking by with the big coat on. So what do we want from our dogs? We want them to be nice and relaxed and we want them to look at us and be able to understand what behavior is acceptable and what we, how we want them to behave. And what do they want from us? They want clear communication. They want you to be reliable, reasonable, and humane. Sometimes even with the best of efforts, these wires can get crossed. And this can cause anxiety both for the humans and the canines involved. Um, there is the potential for mistakes to occur and the dogs to become confused as to what you're asking them to do. Um, and then if this continues, there's also the potential for this behavior to be reinforced. These could potentially lead to dangerous situations if the dog is very anxious. Um, you do not want to use punishment as this causes an increase in fear and anxiety. So avoid all leash corrections, any choke prong or e-collars, um, forcing the dog to go and do something or go somewhere, that kind of thing. It just makes things worse. All right, so how do you provide for your hound? So the basics, we have food, physical exercise, mental stimulation, socialization, and environment. So for food, we wanna provide them a well-balanced diet. Most foods on the market the these days are quite well-balanced. Um, I do wanna mention that grain-free diets have recently been linked to heart disease as an ongoing investigation by FDA. Okay, so let's look at some water. That if you are feeding a no grain-free diet. Providing a variety. So most of our dogs tend to get the same kibble over and over and over. Sometimes you can easily switch those diets to a different flavor, but within the same type of diet, whether it's chicken-based or lamb-based without causing any GI upset. However, some dogs are a little bit more sensitive than others. So providing some different supplements such as vegetables, some fruits or berries mixed in cheese, um, tiny bits of chicken mixed in to just kind of flavor up their normal food or treat time. We can also provide meals, not in their bowls, but via different puzzles or brain games, if you will. Um, there's plenty of things on the market. You can put them into Kongs and freeze them. Um, you can even freeze them in a large bowl or and have the dog try to lick to get that out um, or the puzzle bowls are quite fun. There's a great group online if you're on Facebook called the canine enrichment group and it has tons of ideas both with different types of instruments you can buy to create puzzles but also my favorite upcycling or recycling things you have around already in the house. So here are some examples like toilet paper tubes or paper towel tubes that you can crinkle up and put some treats in using egg cartons or a muffin tin, a towel or a blanket, um, all those kind of things. Just very easy to throw together and allow your dog to have some fun. These are also great for those really hot muggy days where we can't spend a lot of time outside. So I'm a meal prepper and so I meal prep for my pup. So this is what I do on Sunday afternoons. I load up a bunch of different puzzle toys to have at the ready. I do have a few young dogs who need, um, need some extra <laughs> stimulation. So these are great to have on hand for when I'm getting ready for work in the morning. Physical exercise. So providing physical exercise for your dog usually means more than just a walk, especially if you have a young 
um, very energetic pup. Uh, you want to consider the breed and age. There's a lot of young pups who do need a lot of energy, but you need to be careful in choosing their activity because you don't want to put stress on growing joints and bones. Um, so it's typically recommended that you don't do any agility or running until these dogs are skeletally mature. So you want to check with your vet for your specific dog as to when's the best time to start for that. Um, for older dogs, you may also want to consider arthritis or different endocrine disease. There's a lot of rescue dogs that have heartworm disease. It's becoming more prevalent in this area. Um, and also consider your dog's current athletic ability. You can't go for, you know, if you're used to just walking around and never have run in your life, you can't go run a half marathon. And the same thing applies for your dog. So just gradually building up their stamina um, little bit by little bit is what's best for them. Also want to look at the frequency and duration. Make sure that you're not just doing one giant walk for the week, but breaking that up um, into maybe daily walks or every other day walks and keeping an eye on the duration. Again, it can be a little challenging in the warmer weather um, or the really cold weather. So looking at alternatives um, is really important. And here are some of those alternatives. So play is incredibly important for our dogs. That there's a lot of different activities out there. Your dog's friend offers a lot of classes. Um, they have online classes as well as in person sessions right now for those of you who are local. Um, and so there's a great way to introduce yourself to agility or different off leash activities. Um, this is a video of Flyball. So you can watch these guys. They're ready to go. A lot of them are Greyhound working breed crosses and they're running across to get these balls. And there's a lot of intro courses around the tri-state area. So if you'd like to look up any of your local clubs, this is definitely a fun thing to play and learn. These guys are just, they know what's going to happen and they're very excited and very anticipatory. So this is great for dogs that need an activity that maybe they're a herding breed and you don't have sheep or, or things for them available to do that with. Um, the other activity that's newer is called treball or urban herding where they move the ball around and herd it. So that's also another quite popular game. You want to be careful when you're doing uh, activities with your dog, though. You don't want to build up a super athlete. You don't want to get your dog uh, needing and requiring an eight mile run every morning. So just take the long term into consideration and what you're feasibly able to do and provide for your pup. So mental stimulation, um, there's a lot that we can do to provide that can be just as exhausting as physical activity. Again, this is great for the extreme weather temperatures or if your dog needs to be crate rested for a bit and take it easy um, due to recent surgery or things like that. Um, you can allow them to really sniff and kind of just do a loose leaf leash walk amongst the leaves um, to take that. It, and, and do that. There's various kibble toys and Kongs. The environment when there's snow around or rain, kiddie pools are also a great way. You can toss some treats into the kiddie pool even or carrots, um, things to make it just a little bit different for them um, and letting them really enjoy those, those, the sniffing opportunities, we call them sniffaris. Right. So this is just an example of one of the brain games um, I bring. We, I have a friend and we kind of rotate through our puzzles to provide our dogs with some variety of enrichment. Um, and so I have 
several dogs so and I am able to safely have them all interact with the toys. If you have dogs that have any type of guarding behavior, you may want to put one pup in a crate or another room with a nice Kong or long lasting treat and work with your other dog. <laughs> My cats also get involved. <laughs> so it can be quite quite fun for everyone in the household and it, it's cool to see them figure these out. So this is an example my friend um, made of a video of making it really fun and encouraging, especially those very anxious dogs, getting some really high value smelly treats and walking through the grass outside in a quiet area can be really confident building and intriguing for them. So this is, they're just tossing simple treats and things. So this is a great way, again, if you have a very nervous dog who's a little bit more scared of things in the environment to kind of get them to engage and, and explore the, the world around them. Socialization. So a lot of us want dogs that are social. Humans are social creatures and dogs are social creatures. However, not all humans get along with all other humans. So we can't expect that from our dogs either. As you can see in some of these photos, some of these dogs are a little bit scared and not really enjoying this. So in the top left picture, this German Shepherd type dog, is really telling this young, very energetic boxer puppy, hey, back off, I don't really want to play, enough is enough. Um, you can see the open mouth, the ears are back kind of stiff and leaning away from the pup. Up in the top right corner, the Cocker Spaniel being held by, um, and petted by the humans, he's got wide eyes, he's kind of leaning away in a little bit of a stiff posture. Um, he's not really enjoying this as much as the humans are. Down here, it looks like they took their pups out for happy hour. You have the golden retriever dog sitting on the table, licking the guy's nose. He looks very relaxed, um, you know, enjoying himself. The shepherd, the white shepherd type dog with the ears up has open mouth, is panting, which can be a little bit of anxiety. He's also leaning into the person um, and, and up high, which sometimes can also be an indicator of anxiety. Dogs tend to seek higher levels if they're anxious at all. And then here there's a big group of dogs at a dog daycare and you can kind of see there's some dogs that are very loose waggy body posture like the black lab and the golden retriever. Um, whereas this the lab on the left hand side is a little bit more, he kind of has like a hesitant look to his face um, and a little bit of a stiffer posture. His ears are back. He's not quite sure or isn't quite enjoying this as much as everyone else is. So like I said, um, body language is really important for you to understand. A lot of folks say, well, my dog's wagging his tail. So wagging their tail can means that the dog is willing to engage, but it doesn't tell you exactly how the dog is willing to engage. A very stiff, slow wag tends to mean that the dog is anxious and the engagement that they're prepared for is not a, going to be a positive one. Whereas a nice loose tail wag and slow wag tends to be a lot more of a welcoming let's play kind of way. So you also want to look at their face for a nice relaxed posture. The, this husky dog has a nice soft mouth. He's kind of play biting with the other dog. There's a loose curled up tail. Huskies tend to have that type of curled up tail, some, uh, some other breeds as well. Um, but if you can imagine this was a video, it's just a soft back and forth wag. The eyes are nice and relaxed. They're not squinted at all. And so is the mouth. Whereas on the right hand side, these dogs are telling each other to get the heck away. Um, they're very tense. They've drawn, they're snarling. They have their teeth exposed and their nose is all scrunched up. Their eyes are squinted. Their pupils are quite dilated, um, although it may be hard for you to appreciate that. Um, and they tend to react very quickly. So if you see your dog starting to show these signs, you want to bring them to a nice quieter spot, 
um, and kind of redirect them away. So a couple more examples of body language. So this young pup, very cute, kind of doing what we call a play bow. So you can see mouth is open, the front end is lowered, nice, slow, relaxed tail, um, kind of ready to engage. The ears are forward and floppy. Whereas here, again, you have the snarling faces. Um, you can see the crinkles in their lips as well as their teeth. Their ears are drawn back and their eyes are squinty. Um, the German Shepherd, I know it's hard to see it here, but their hackles may be up um, and the tail is in a very stiff posture. It's not moving very much at all. So for the environment, I'm not saying that you need to provide a, a dog area worthy of MTV cribs, but it is nice to be able to provide your dog a nice comfortable area to relax. We really want to be able to give our dog the choice from interacting with us to go into a nice quiet space. I know a lot of folks are hesitant to set up a kennel or use a crate, um, but they can be kind of like when we go in and take a nice bubble bath and just zen out by ourselves, that can kind of be that type of relief for dogs. And it's nice for them to have that ability to be quiet and wind down. Um, so, you know, some dogs are very aversive to crates. So just providing a nice quiet area or using a baby gate or exercise pen where they can go. And, you know, when they're in there, that's their time. They get left alone um, and they're not willing to engage. All right, so you have a hyper dog and you need a plan. So first step first, you wanna get all your household members involved. You wanna make sure that you have a calm environment because trying to start when there's a lot of distractions going on, you have folks playing soccer over here, the next door neighbor's dog is barking, your dog is gonna have a very hard time to focus and so will you and it will just end in frustration. So you wanna start with a nice quiet time of day and just a small amount of time, just like us, dogs' attention spans don't last very long. So it's nice to do, they learn better with small frequent bursts. So one of the best times of day for me is when I'm waiting for my kettle to boil to make tea. And so I just do some basic reminders. So kind of look at different points of your day that you could easily build this into your routine, a minute here, two minutes there. Um, you usually want to choose a room that you do spend the most time in. For most folks, this is the living room and kitchen areas. Um, and it should be fun for everyone. So if you're in a bad mood or feel like you're forced to do this, don't do it. It's, it's not going to be good for, your, for you or your pup or your relationship with each other. So start with the basics. A lot of our dogs have these foundations of sit down, place or stay, but we need to refresh them a little bit and maybe work on duration. So a longer down instead of just 30 seconds, they can lay down for two minutes and working up towards that. Um, making sure again that you're providing physical exercise and mental stimulation. Maybe with families, you can make a schedule and help, you know, different folks can do different parts of the day, that type of thing. So also we have some more a little bit more advanced things for our pups to learn. So le teaching them how to settle or go to their place and be able to breathe and check in with you are all really important things. You want to make sure that you always have clear communication with your pup and avoid punishment. If your pup is not focusing and not able to do what you're asking them or offering other behaviors, the best thing to do is just walk away. I know it can be very frustrating, but instead of repeatedly asking your dog to sit, 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 they clearly, they're either not in that mind frame uh, and the best thing to do is just walk away. Sometimes you can just walk away into another room, your dog will follow you, you can re-ask them to sit and kind of reset both of yourselves, you reset the environment um, and start from there. But you just want to make sure that you're only rewarding with either treats and or praise or petting any type of attention when they're doing the calm behavior that you want them to do. So if they get too amped up and excited, which again is probably what some of the dogs um, are doing in this category, you want to stop playing and just walk away. One of the things you can teach your dog is to be quiet on command if they are a very vocal dog. Um, using a head collar and leash can also help if they're jumping uh, on you or lunging. 
One thing to keep in mind though, is that if your dog is displaying and exhibiting some of these unwanted behaviors and you start ignoring them instead of telling them no, no, or off, off, um, what you'll see is an extinction burst because what you are doing by saying no, no, and off, off is giving them attention and rewarding that behavior. So to your dog, when they jump on you or paw at you, they're getting rewarded and that's giving them attention, what they want. So if instead now your dog is pawing at you while you're trying to watch the news and you get up and walk away, they're going to try to keep pawing at you or jumping on you because that worked before. And so what we see sometimes is what's called an extinction burst where the behavior increases because, hey, this worked for me before. Why doesn't it work? Um, but then it should decrease and, and slowly fade out. So I'm not sure, you know, we have folks I know of various dog training levels here. So I'm just going to go through some of these basics for some folks who are newer um, with or building their relationships with their pups. But for place, you want to take either a mat, a blanket, a dog bed, something that you're where your dog is normally tends to go on or you want to encourage them to go on. Um, I love bath mats. They're nice and easy to take around. Have them wait until they get you know, they're ready to settle down after you've gone for a walk, after they've had their meal, those kind of things, and scatter some treats on the mat or on the bed to get them interested in it. And then continue to reward the behavior as they start to relax, they sit, they lay down. You can build, gradually build up to you sitting down and taking a few, a few breaths, sorry, and tossing them some more treats and gradually building up that duration. And one of the great things about this is to make sure you give your dog some sort of release cue that says, okay, we're done. Um, so, or all done, all set, uh, whatever, whatever works for you. And it's helpful to get rid of the mat while you're working on this behavior so that it's not always out. Teaching dogs to settle. So <laughs> this is Easier said than done, I'm sure most of you are thinking. Um, again, working with a place and using some sort of prop. Here there's various styles of elevated beds, but a mat or anything can be helpful. It tends to be easier for the dogs to learn when they have that extra visual cue of a place. Um, and so again, working on with a mat or easy to transport thing can be very helpful as you're trying to work towards more busy environments and getting them to roll relax. So having them settle first, just stepping one paw or two paws and rewarding them for that, then waiting them to get four paws. It's quite funny to watch them and kind of see those light bulbs go off as they realize what you're asking them to do. So here's a video of an example, since I'm not doing this in person. Um, and my pup is not always um, <laughs> agreeable to being a demo dog. There is a nice video by Sarah Owings that we'll share here. So this is a common behavior. A lot of pups want to jump up onto a couch or the furniture. So just redirecting them just like she did. Here you go. A couple noises or tapping the ground um, to get them to come down onto the blanket. And for now, she's just starting with training with Q-tips. So she's tossing treats quite, quite frequently here. And so when we see dogs with their hips shifted to one side, they're kind of leaning on one side or the other, we call that a hip cock. And that is a signal to us that they're in a relaxed body posture.
And so you can use treats. You can also use kibble from your pup's meal, um, especially for some pups who are watching their weight. Or I like to make a little trail mix of treats where I mix in some kibble and some really stinky pieces of cheese or hot dog or chicken um, and, and really make it a high value kind of variety of things. And so we're looking for that nice, lovely relaxed posture. Her tail is nice and relaxed lying down. And she's gradually increasing the time between. Now each dog is different, just like humans. So your dog may need, you need to do rapid reinforcement for several days before you can move on to taking a breath in between each treat. Um, and then gradually working up to where you're actually able to stand and walk up away from your dog while they remain settled on the mat. Oops. So sit is one of the basics as well. And sometimes it's very hard for kind of those really jumpy yo-yo dogs. Um, so really utilizing it in everyday activities before you feed them or waiting for them to settle and sit when you get home from work before even looking at them or touching them or giving them any type of attention. Um, if they're still hyper, just walk away, put your purse down, go, you know, go, go sit down in another room. Um, and that kind of thing. So just building it again, that's just building it slowly throughout your day. All right, so you're telling me you're doing all these things, but your pup is still running circles around you. So what do you do then? I recommend that you talk with your regular veterinarian or if um, they recommend or you feel that you'd like to speak with a veterinarian who specializes in behavior, reach out to them. Uh, there are some supplements that are currently on the market as over-the-counter things, um, but most vet clinics hold have these in stock. So the first thing is the dog appeasing pheromone. There's a plug-in diffuser as well as a collar. And so we just recommend that you put that plug-in diffuser near their, where they spend the most amount of time. And it gets replaced about every month or so. The collar has to be closely fitted to their neck because it's activated by the warmth of their body. Um, and this can be helpful, especially for nervous dogs um, who are very nervous outside the home on walks and things, uh, or going to the vet, those, those type of things. They also have a spray. So I spritz um, the mats that I have in my clinic. When I do house consults, I spray some on my legs and my clothing um, to just try to give off <laughs> some extra calming vibes to my patients. Um, Zilkine and Anxetine are both nutraceuticals that contain, um, Zilkine contains L-tryptophan and alpha casozepine and those Anxetine also has L-theanine which is um, an amino acid that is within green tea and these can also have calming effects. The last product that's recommended is Calming Care Probiotic by Purina. This has a strain of bacteria that's been proven to help dogs be more calm during stressful situations. With all of these supplements, it does take four to six weeks to reach full effects. So most of them come in about a one month supply. Um, Calming Care comes in a 45 packet. So there's 45 days worth in there. So I tell folks if they get one bottle or one box of whatever supplement they choose, if you don't see any difference by the end of it, then discontinue it. Um, they have very little, they have little known side effects. The only thing with the calming care is they do use a li dried liver powder to flavor it. And so if your dog has food allergies, that's something you want to consider. All right. A lot of folks have questions about what about CBD? I have these CBD treats and they worked for my cousin's dog um, or I use it for myself. Can I give it to my pup? So in short, in a nutshell, CBD is not regulated. There's very little quality control. So you need to be very careful at what you're purchasing. There's no guarantee that there's a certain amount in each treat or however it's supplemented, tablet, et cetera. Um, there's no studies on the effect of CBD on behavior in animals right now. However, there was a study done on arthritis in older dogs. It was a small group, I believe about eight dogs in the study where they did see improvement from osteoarthritic pain. There is definitely a potential, especially from what we see in human medicine, of 
the potential awesomeness of using CBD. However, right now, and there is a lot of toxicosis problems. In 2019, the Animal Poison Control Center had a huge jump in marijuana ingestion by animals. And this was mainly due to THC toxicosis. And so there was a lot of pets in the ER that were taking either human products um, that caused these issues. And so I warn folks to be very cautious when using this and buyer beware. Um, in addition, human products can also contain xylitol, which is a sweetener that can't, is very toxic for pets. It can have grape and raisin extracts, which causes renal failure in dogs, even very small trace amounts. Um, and they can also contain contaminants such as lead. So just buyer beware and be careful. Um, hopefully in the future, we'll have more information and it may be better regulated and we'll have more studies. But for now, we can't really guarantee anything. There is a f another webinar done by Dr. Leslie Sin on CBD um, here at Your Dog's Friend. So you can find that on the website. So if you'd like to learn more about this and delve into it a little bit more, she does a great literature review. So medications. Uh, so, <laughs> Some of the dogs, or most of the dogs that I see, definitely benefit from some additional stronger medications. Um, gabapentin is one that is also called Neurontin in human medicine. It's used to treat neuropathic pain, but it can also help with anxiety. And so that's a lovely drug, especially for some older dogs who may have some anxiety, um, but also arthritis or back pain, other things that are going on. Um, so it can be very helpful. And then we have the maintenance medications. These are the tricyclic antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. And these are generally given as a once or twice a day dose, but they take six to eight weeks to reach full effects. And so because of that, we tend to reach for shorter acting medications in the meantime. And these include trazodone, which is a serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitor. Um, and this works very quickly. Uh, a lot of folks are using it for their dogs or before they take them into the vet if they have any anxiety there. Um, and it works quite well for most dogs. Central alpha agonist clonidine, which is a blood pressure medication in humans, but also used to treat PTSD is also very helpful for dogs that are easily triggered. Um, also other short acting like alprazolam or Xanax. Um, and then anti-diarrheals, of course, we need to address the GI issues for those dogs that have that. So using metronidazole or loperamide as well may be part of the treatment plan. So your dog's friend, we are incredibly lucky to have this organization here in our area and also now to have all these seminars available online to reach a much wider audience. Again, they have a great set up for both in-person and online classes. I am taking some myself and I highly recommend you check them out. Um, Decoding Your Dog by the Diplomat, uh, Diplomats of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists is an excellent book that just came out um, in the past few years and has some is really quick, easy, but also very interesting reading material. I think every dog owner should have it. And then for these more hyper energetic dogs, I always recommend Feisty Fido by Pat McConnell, um, Fired Up Frantic and Freaked Out, Click to Calm, and the Relaxation and Deference Protocol um, created by Karen Overall. So these are all great additional resources for you to use. Um, again, your dog's friend, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk with everyone. And now I have time to answer your questions, if you have any. Okay, let me go back. Um, one question that came in early on, and it, it must refer to either food or treats, whatever you were talking about at the time, is grain-free or plant-based? I'm sorry, is grain-free? Or plant-based. I She means probably either food or treats, or I'm not sure what you were talking about at that point. Sure. So for their main diet where the dogs are getting the most nutrients, grain-free food, there's a lot of companies marketing grain-free food. Um, but unfortunately, that's starting to be associated with 
issues with cardiac disease. I've seen it myself and some several very young, otherwise very healthy dogs who have enlarged hearts because of this. And we're not quite sure what it is in the grain yet. Um, the FDA, like I mentioned, has an ongoing investigation. So if the majority of your dog's diet is grain-free, I would recommend talking with your vet and switching to a similar but not grain-free diet. And then as far as treats go, if you're feeding your the basic meals that your dog is getting, the majority of food is not grain-free. Using some grain-free treats to supplement is fine. Another question was, mental stimulation is equivalent to how much physical activity in time? <laughs> Do you have a statistic for that? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't have a statistic for that. I can get back to you and see. Has it's anybody like, studied that? So it really varies for different breeds and different personalities of dogs. Um, I do scent work with my one at my hound, and I'm also starting that with my lab. And my hound really gets, I mean, she her whole body, she just focuses on her nose. She can't even see right in front of her. We, she was sent, sent tracking a deer and the deer was standing several feet from us and she, I could see it very clearly, but she was just so focused on her nose. She didn't. Whereas my lab is not, he's somewhat interested, but not as interested. So trying to do scent work with him is not as engaging and exhausting. Um, so it, it really varies. Okay. Uh, let me find the next one. Oh, examples of smelly treats. Salmon sure. is one. <laughs> yes, so salmon-based treats, if you prefer the pre-made treats like um, Zooks or Zeewee treats, they also have like a, a very nice dried lamb. The, there's dried liver treats that smell quite differently. Pieces of cheese or hot dogs. Um, some folks make their own using canned food or cat food tends to be really stinky. Um, so if you want to use a little bit of like shredded cat food and bake that into treats or something. Um, and chicken, roast rotisserie chicken, if you kind of like pull it apart into little pieces, that can be quite stinky or deli meats for very high value treats. The dried kibble One tends thing. to not be as aromatic. Um, and so... That's why mixing in a little bit of those high value treats that are quite, quite tasty. And it, it's really interesting. You can do a taste test with your dog where you have two plates, paper plates or two, you know, regular plates if you trust your dog not to break them. Um, and you can put like a piece of broccoli and a piece of chicken and see what they prefer. And this has been really interesting. This was kind of going around the dog training community um, uh, maybe a month or so ago. And some dogs were preferring the broccoli over the chicken and it you know you really you i i would have put money on the fact that the chicken would have been the first choice but so it's kind of interesting to see your individual dog and there's like a hierarchy so knowing peanut butter flavored treats yeah he doesn't really think that much of it but yogurt and canned pumpkin inside a squeeze tube is like the best thing for him so so you know it's all individual just like us we all have different tastes preferences if you do use salmon treats, don't leave it open in your car. <laughs> be searching for things that can get rid of the odor. Yes. It took a while to find something. If you want the smelliest treat, that's one of them. Um, here's a question I partly answered, um, but you may have something to add. I've had my rescue for six months and she's one year and a couple of months. I'm not sure if she gets along with other dogs. I was going to take her on a trail. Sometimes there are dogs there. Other people, new places, just not sure how she will do. I thought about the dog park, but probably too overwhelming for her. How do I go about this situation? Dr. Conley, what do you have? So I definitely agree with you that the dog park is likely going to be too much. You can't control other people or their dogs. And so I really, especially if you're unsure of your dog, I really, I don't think dog parks are the best place. If you have a place near you that you can take your pup where you can walk far away, like maybe a big sports field area where you can see dogs from a distance, and gradually get closer, but have plenty of space to escape or get away if it's too much for your pup. 
um, before you go on a hiking trail where you're in a very confined space along the, the trail part and it's very crowded because um, that won't be much fun for you or your pup if that's the case. Okay, um, is it possible or probable to have a dog that is anxious and reactive? My dog goes berserk when he sees any other living being while on a walk. This is to the point that he will not focus or listen to anything or anyone else. This also happens when any unfamiliar person comes to the house. These stressful times often result in GI issues as well. Any advice on how to begin changing this behavior in yeah. 10 seconds or less? <laughs> I would yeah. highly recommend that you speak with your veterinarian and or consider a veterinary behaviorist for your dog. It sounds like life in general is very tough for him or her and they need uh, some help. Look around our videos as well. We've had a, videos on a lot of these issues. You can see them on our website or our YouTube channel and on our website also on your behavior issues. There's some very quick reading handouts. Well, yes. handouts don't read quickly, but quickly read handouts. There we go. Um, okay, Re reactivity usually is associated with anxiety and stress and fear. So it's very possible <laughs> that you have, your dog has both. Um, should the adapter diffuser be used continuously or is it okay to use it as needed? For example, a day when you have visitors coming over. So if you know that there's gonna be a stressful event, I usually recommend it even for medications or things to get it in place a day or two ahead of time, um, set up a nice calm environment. The pheromones can have, uh, it's nice, they last 30 days. So plugging it in a few days ahead of time um, up until that point to allow it time to get diffused throughout the room would be ideal. Okay, my rescue mini Bassett is afraid of so many things. Any advice on how to help him? Hmm. Yeah, so fearful dogs um, can be very challenging to work with. So starting with a positive reinforcement trainer, looking around the Your Dog's Friend website, they have some really great advice as well as videos for step-by-step. -step. Um, but working with a reinforcement, positive reinforcement trainer one-on-one -on -one may be more helpful for you and your pup. Um, there is a specific uh, video we have um, that trainer Juliana Willems did called How to Help My Fearful Dog Navigate the World. Yes. That would be a really good one for you. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing, we do have trainer and veterinary behavior, veterinary behaviorist recommendations if you look for trainers on your own, you may not pick up little hints that they all, a lot of them sound positive and aren't. So, you know, again, uh, if you get the wrong trainer, it can cause some severe issues. So please, you know, pick our brains. Yes. So on the Your Dog's website under resources, there's positive trainers and behaviorists and it lists them by area. Um, how do we get our adolescent dog to stop nipping and mouthing? Making sure you provide appropriate play. Sometimes with adolescents, they kind of are like toddlers where things amp up and they get more hyper as they get more tired. So just kind of realizing, okay, after about five minutes of this game, he gets a little too amped up and starts becoming mouthy um, or jumpy and putting them in their crate or settling down, have them settle onto another room um, behind a baby gate while you go do something else um, and just ignoring that behavior um, or giving them like a long lasting chew toy, like a frozen Kong to kind of redirect that behavior too can also be helpful. And then there's a comment that um, Jacqueline has noticed that grain free diets are also plant-based. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but um, okay. With two dogs, while the puppy is playing with us humans, the older dog will suddenly get agitated from a calm posture. It will jump at the puppy. 
Why is this happening and how do we deal with it? So it is not uncommon for us to see issues between older dogs and younger dogs. Sometimes that's usually just because they're very different play levels, just kind of like different age stages of humans. We, you know, 20 year olds don't want 50 year olds don't want to hang out with 20 year olds and party all day um Hopefully. that kind of thing but the other concern that we have is with the older pups they may actually be in discomfort of some sort like arthritis is very common and although it may not be seen on normal behavior normal walks and things if they have a puppy trying to overplay with them or jump on them and nudge them uh, they may be uncomfortable also older dogs do tend to lose their vision and hearing so sometimes they are more easily startled and this is one of the first signs that we see is that they become um, very agitated and sometimes aggressive towards the younger dog in the household okay Alyssa wants to know how to curb anxious whining so needing to figure out what is making your pup anxious and trying to help build up the confidence. Um, if it's anxious whining where they're anticipating you're leaving and it's a symptom of separation anxiety, that's something you need to talk to your veterinarian about. Um, if it's about becoming anxious, if there's other dogs around and they're just, they want to go play or they're a fearful of the other dog and want to go back in the house. Um, those are things that you can work with a trainer on as well. Um, but again, with some dogs that aren't responsive to any type of training and this is persistent, that's usually a sign that you really need to talk to your veterinarian about it. Okay. Um, my dog is on fluoxidine. It has helped him a lot. How long should I keep him on it? He is 11 months now and had really bad anxiety. That's a great question. Um, so dogs are not fully mentally mature until they're about three years of age. Fluoxetine is Prozac for those of you who don't know, it's an SSRI and it works on changing receptors in the brain. I tell most of my folks, my clients and um, the patients and their families that when we start an animal on a medication for behavior, we usually want to have a good solid six to 12 months of improved behavior before we start to attempt to wean them off. So in general, for me, that's around their annual recheck and we kind of see where things are at. In more extreme cases, it may be at the two year mark. Um, and then we gradually taper down the medication because these behavior medications, all of them should not be suddenly stopped because they can cause um, you know, symptoms, side effects in your dog that aren't great. Um, and so about 50% of the dogs do very well off of the medication. And the other 50% do need to have the medication, but may be able to do um, better at a lower dose. It's really very individualized and it's very hard to predict who will and who won't be able to handle being off the medication at that point. Here is an interesting question that I think everyone can benefit from. To confirm, is it best to talk to a vet before trying supplements or could I try one of the over-the-counter supplements and see if it helps? Sure. So I do think talking with your vet and just making sure the very first thing we do, you would be surprised at how much behavior is motivated by discomfort or some underlying medical condition. And so I think the best thing to do is to just talk with your vet, have an appointment with your vet, have your pet examined and make sure that there's no obvious underlying issue going on that could be contributing to their issues and then starting the supplements. Um, like I said, it does take several weeks for the supplements uh, to, to reach full effects. And so if you're experiencing any type of issues with your dog, you wanna get that addressed as soon as possible. Okay, Kathy has a stepson with a high energy dog that digs holes if she doesn't watch him all the time. What can she do? Sure. So some uh, folks like to give their dog a certain space where they're able to dig the holes. Um, so whether that's providing a sandbox or just dedicating a specific area that's marked out in your backyard for your dog to safely dig and encourage them to dig. Um, also making sure that they have plenty of other proper mental stimulation. They could be doing that to try to get comfortable. So if it's an 
um, has any type of joint disease or things like that, scratching and digging can also be because they're trying to find a, a make a comfortable spot to be in. And this is an interesting dog here. My dog, 15 months, adopted at three months, loves being on the trail or kayaking, but is anxious and terrified trying to walk around the neighborhood or a non-nature environment. Any tips on how to build her confidence? Yes. So that is not actually as uncommon as you think it is, um, especially in this area of DC. We get a lot of dogs that come from very, very rural areas and aren't used to the noise and hustle bustle and all the concrete pathways in the very tight, closed spaces. Um, especially with the pandemic, we've had an increase of of pet population and people being outside like all the time. There's not really a quiet time of day. So there's a lot of things going on. That's a lot for some dogs to take in. Um, so finding a place that is similar, but quieter. So a couple of the places like uh, church parking lots during the week, um, business uh, parks on the weekend, they're kind of a similar setup, but not as populated with people or animals. And so you might be able to gradually start to introduce that type of environment to your pup, finding very high value treats and starting off small, but recognizing when your dog is, is stressed out and stopping, forcing them to go into an environment that they're scared of is not is not helpful and can make things a lot worse. Um, and for some dogs, they do better with a backyard and having field trips to those more nature type field trips as opposed and staying in their backyard as opposed to their daily walks around the neighborhood. Um, I know I sound like a broken record, but we have a video um, about helping rural dogs adjust to city or suburban environments. And I'd love to tell you the exact name, except I can't right now. I'd have to jump off and jump back on. Um, but it, it was a few months ago. If you go to our website and keep going backwards, you'll find it. And that's a good one for dogs who do better in more rural environments and are kind of freaking out around city and suburbs. Um, is it normal for a two-year-old beagle mix to get zoomies every evening before bedtime? Is it a sign that he is not getting enough daily physical and or mental stimulation? So a two-year-old beagle is still somewhat a pup or adolescent and zoomies at uh, around mealtime or bedtime is is very common in a lot of different dogs. Um, as long as they settle down, I know my own hound, she's almost nine years old now and she does zoomies and then settles in for the night. Um, and for her, that's normal. My other hound, he does no zoomies at all, really, unless he's outside in the backyard chasing squirrels. So it, it, it's not something to really worry about unless they're getting up in the middle of the night and doing that at inappropriate times and unable to settle. Um, Patty wanted to ask you what you call it when the pup lays on their hip or side on a mat. Sure, I, we call it, I call it a hip cock or a, um, sometimes a more technical term is in left lateral recumbency if they're on their entire left side with also their shoulders and their front legs to the left or to the right. Can we just call it settle? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yep, that's or in a training book. They settle. Look sorry. Yep. Settle. Now you gave the, the veterinarian answer. Sorry. <laughs> no wonder you didn't remember what she said. Thank you for inter interpreting, Deborah. <laughs> okay. My mini golden doodle loves broccoli. Okay. Well, mine love, I swear, my dogs will work for carrots and string beans. Yep. I had a dog that would work for ice cubes, although... Dentists, the veterinary dentists don't recommend that because they chip their teeth, but he would do anything for an ice cube. So like I said, we all have different preferences and so do our pups. So have some fun figuring that out with them. Mm -hmm. Is the response the same regardless of the nature of the hyperness? The, the human response would be mm -hmm. this. Yes. Yeah, um, I think. Yes, if that's the answer to the question. Um, 
hyperness can look very different in the dog's responses and but the human response should always be the same. You don't want to encourage it and even brushing them kind of when a jump, dog jumps on you, you want to turn, turn away and walk away, go into a different room. Just don't give them any type of attention. Okay, Rebecca pointed out to everybody that Sniff Spot is an app where you can rent private backyards. Yes, that is That's great. Um, it started out on the West Coast and now it's here on the East Coast as well. And it's also a great way to find uh, a very quiet place to take your dog um, in new environments as well. Okay, our rescue dog that we've had for four weeks walks with a harness for about a half mile and then will flip out, grab the leash, bite at us and jump. We have tried distraction, throwing treats, having him sit, but nothing seems to stop him until he wears himself out, and then he will continue the walk with no problem. He will have these outbursts in the house as well when we don't give him attention. What would you suggest? So if you could start off the walk before you even put a leash on your dog and go outside, do a few easily simple, some of the, the things your dog loves to do. One of my dogs loves to touch, which is their nose going to your hand. Um, sit, a down, spin, any type of trick you may have taught them to wave to kind of get them a little bit engaged, but in a calm manner before you go outside. Using tools such as a, a the front clip harness, as well as a head halter, such as a gentle leader or halty, can also be helpful for the pulling and jumping um, and trying to redirect them if they either have a favorite food or a toy um, that isn't as incredibly exciting, but maybe more of the middle to lower level of their excitement level that you could distract them with, whether it's tossing a treat on the floor or throwing the ball, you know, go get the ball over here a couple feet away um, to redirect them. And so that they also are doing something else with their mouth and mouthing you. Um, if this continues, I would recommend if you can have someone videotape you and your pup doing these behaviors and get with um, a positive reinforcement trainer and or a veterinary behaviorist before things escalate more. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Kelly lives in Long Island and is wondering how to find a veterinary behaviorist. She said there aren't any. Yes. So there is actually, um, I don't believe there's anyone on Long Island, but there is, um, there is someone in New York City, behavior vets. Um, if you go to DACVB, that's DACVB.org. You can type in your zip code and find a boarded veterinary behaviorist near you. Okay. Um, There's less than a hundred of us in the world. So yeah, um, we're and very we've lucky got, in this to area, have we're going to have five. Yes. Yes. It's, so. we're very lucky here to have a lot of folks. I work for an animal rescue and I'm the only person who is responsible for doing behavior modification training. These, there are two days where we have no one to take over that training regimen. I've noticed the dogs regress every time I have my days off and I have to keep restarting the progress that is being made. Is it better to not do any counter conditioning and have adopters work on this once the dog is adopted or to have some behavior um, mod being implemented, but it's inconsistent. I can't always do it every day due to workload and it's technically an additional project rather than my actual job. So I have worked a lot in the rescue environment and it's definitely a tough environment to work on. One of the great successes that I've seen is having a volunteer program with different training levels. Um, if you have folks that volunteer or other employees that walk the dogs or feed the dogs or interact with them and teaching them some very basic things to do those reinforcers when they see the dog during the normal day to help fill in those gaps for you. That will also help strengthen with the dog, um, their ability and their learning ability if they're working with different people. I know it's tough, but I would recommend to keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for giving these pets another chance. Here's another question about CBD, but this time it's in the context of 
her dog not allowing the groomer to cut his nails. So again, with CBD, it's not something I can really recommend because it's not well regulated or not regulated at all at this point in, in pet products and human products tend to be quite toxic for them. Um, so I would talk with your vet about using perhaps something um, to either help your dog feel more at ease during, as needed for grooming sessions, a medication, and also working with a, a trainer to help desensitize them to being handled for grooming. Um, there is, we have a page about grooming on our website and there is a, um, a video on that page that gives you an idea of how to get your dog used to things before they ever go to the groomer. Uh, and that would be a big help. Uh, just having the clippers around and giving him treats and touching one nail and giving him treats. You, you'll see it. There's a lot you can do at home. And then some groomers are more compassionate. And those may be the people you want to look for. Are invisible fences effective? So invisible fences tend to utilize an electric collar, a shock, and we do not recommend that because that can cause increased fear and anxiety in dogs. Um, having a physical fence is better recommended and or leash walking. Okay, um, how can you stop excessive barking? My dogs bark around the door, the window seems to be the trigger but we need to figure out how to stop barking. So if your dog is barking at things that they can see or hear out the window or near the door, some of the things you can do is uh, buy what's called window wallpaper or window decals. And they make some very pretty designs that you can put up that makes it sort of opaque and the dog can't see people or other dogs or trucks walking by, um, going by the window. And so you have less triggers to set them off to bark. Now, if you live in an apartment building where there's a lot of commotion outside the door, having something like a white noise machine um, or fan by the door to help block that noise can be quite helpful. Can anxiety create reaction to harness? It doesn't go over the head. Our dog has always had an issue, though she's happy to go for a walk once it's on. Would you recommend trying a gentle leader instead? Note that she has anxiety with new things, too. Yes. So having a harness that fits a dog, especially if they're very anxious and they have a high flight risk um, and or a martingale collar uh, are things that I recommend. Having a head halter placed on like a gentle leader or halty can be quite um, unnatural for the dog at first, approaching their face or head can be um, a threatening behavior. So it's something that they need to get used to. And your dog's friend also has a nice video, um, Deborah. I don't know who, if you could chime in, but getting them used to wearing a harness. Some dogs do better with a step-in harness that they learn to step in um, and that clips over their back. There are other harnesses um, that don't require going over the head or that are a little bit more lightweight made. Um, for, for dogs that are having issues with that. But again, slow and steady to get them used to that. Um, I think that Marnie Montgomery on her website has something about favorite equipment. Um, and that would be joyfuldogllc.com. Um, you might find that helpful or you might want to write to her. Um, and, and see what she would recommend. What is a good length for a long leash if we want to use one for recall training? So this depends on the space that you have available. Um, so you can get 20 or 40 foot leads. Just make sure that they're made of a tough, durable material and that they're securely anchored to either yourself or a post. Um, I have a hound dog who likes to jump fences, so she's constantly on the tether or long lead. Um, and this year, because I adopted a new puppy, I needed to get a stainless steel cable version because the puppy kept biting through her long regular lead. 
Um, but you know, whatever is most comfortable for your dog. You do want to take care though, if you are in an area with other dogs or people, shorten the lead up and be able to quickly recall your dog in for that. Um, because you know, you don't, it's harder to intervene and in, in kind of keep your dog at bay um, when they're on that long lead. I think that may be about it. Okay. But I think we got to the wall. Well, um, information, contact information is here. Yes. Yeah. My contact information is on the Your Dogs website. You can also go to AtlanticVeterinaryBehavior.com um, and you can contact us there via email. Um, if you'd like to book an appointment, you can do that on our website as well. Um, and, and, you know, kind of reach out and get in touch. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to respond. Um, okay, and someone just asked me to share the donations link, which I will be happy to do. Yes. Thank you very much. This was a terrific talk. And I hope that everyone learned a lot. I'm sure they must have. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And please, if you can donate to your dog's friend, like I said, they're a great organization. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk with you all. Well, thank you. Bye, everybody.